Annalie Peterson. I'm a master's student in the Soil Science Department at North Dakota State University. And the title of my talk today is Kelsey Mass State, an alternative to gypsum for improving brine impacted soils. So first I just want to start off with some background information. And this is a graph showing oil production in North Dakota over about the last 40 years or so. And as you can see, since just before 2010, there was a major increase in oil production in North Dakota. And since 2012, North Dakota has been the second leading producer of oil and natural gas in the United States, only second to Texas. And the reason we saw such an abrupt increase in oil and natural gas production in North Dakota is because of horizontal drilling and fracking. And so this is what a typical horizontal oil well in North Dakota looks like today. And it was only in 2006 that the first successful horizontal drilling and fracking effort was um, that happened. And I can explain this briefly. I'm sure a lot of you know a lot more about these parts than I do. But first, the well bore is drilled, and that is drilled to the kickoff point, which is the 90 degree turn. And that extends into the oil, oil holding rock units. And then a perforating gun is then dropped down into this. That's after this is lined with some sort of pipe or casing, cement, concrete. And once this perforating gun is lowered into the oil holding rock units, this then busts through the pipe and also busts through the, in this case, the upper and lower Bakken channel. And that's represented by the stone of the triangles there. And then this perforating gun is then removed. And your fracking fluids are then pumped into this well, which then help to extend the cracks. And then you can start your oil pumping operations. And so this is a map of North Dakota. And this shows the amount of wells that have been drilled in North Dakota from 2007 to 2018. So this is after 2006, of course. And so all these wells use horizontal drilling techniques. And this also shows the Bakken and Three Forks formation. And these are our main rock reservoirs that hold most of the oil and natural gas that North Dakota produces. And so um, since I'm kind of a geology nerd, I wanted to go more into the geology of these rock units. So this is a map that shows the Wilson Basin in North Dakota. So the far left side shows the western border between North Dakota and Montana. And then as you continue further right, that represents the eastern part of the state. And just for some further geographical context, there's a Missouri River that's labeled there. And then you can see the Bakken and the Three Forks Formation represented by the really light blue rock unit. And I have an arrow there which pointed towards it. So as you can see, the depth of these rock units varies across the state. And I think the Williston Basin is just a really cool um, sequence of rocks because there's not many places in the world where you get such a complete collection of sedimentary rocks. But this is an example of one of them here in North Dakota. And so the Bakken and Three Forks formation were deposited during the late Devonian period and early Mississippian period. And this coincided with what's known as the Kaskaskia transgression. So this also happened during the late Devonian and early Mississippian period. Um, so the Kaskaskia transgression is one of six um, well-known major rises in sea levels that we have recorded in our sedimentary rocks here. And so when we have a major rise in sea level, that means our marine waters inundate our continental lands and they leave uh, large packages of marine deposits. So that explains why we see so many of these marine deposits in North Dakota today. And I also wanted to include a map of what our continents looked like during this time. So you can see North Dakota is kind of in the center there. It's part of Laurasia at the time. And it's also near the equator. Um, so it's kind of a tropical environment during this time. And the part of this map that's represented in the blue represents land that we see today, but at the time was underwater. So also explains why we have such large marine sedimentary packages. Um, so now going back to what we came here to talk about, which was brine and oil production. So this is what a typical brine solution can look like. And as you can see, a lot of the salts in the solution have precipitated out. So brine is primarily composed of sodium chloride, and this makes sense since we're pumping up the solution from our ancient marine deposits. And the amount of brine that is produced alongside our oil varies through time, but usually at the beginning of our drilling operations, we see about a two to one ratio of oil to brine, to brine that's produced. But through time, we see that this ratio of brine to oil typically increases. But on average, 
For the total longevity of the well, we see about an 18 to 1 ratio of brine to oil that's produced. And brine also has electrical conductivity measurements that are often greater than 200 decibels per meter. And they also have total dissolved solid measurements that are also often greater than 250,000 milligrams per liter. And this is a map showing Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And then we also have Bakken formation again that's outlined by the red line. And so it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here, so I blew it up just a little bit. But the points on this map represent samples of brine that were taken, and their color corresponds to the amount of total dissolved solids that are in these solutions. So as you can see, the amount of total dissolved solids is kind of all over the place, but nonetheless, I think it's also obvious to see that, oops, sorry, <laughs> that a lot of these measurements contain total dissolved solids that are greater than 321,000 milligrams per liter. So why are we so concerned about brine? Well, there's multiple reasons. And first, we'll start out with the negative effects that brine can have on our plant communities. So if we have an excess of salts in our soils, this can cause ionic stress upon our plants. This can disrupt any enzyme activity and protein synthesis. And if there's too many salts in our soils, this can also cause osmotic stress, which induces drought-like conditions upon our plants. This can stunt growth, inhibit water uptake, can also cause our leaves to wilt. And if there's too much sodium in our soils, this can cause um, oxidative stress, which leads to the accumulation of reactive oxygen species. And if there's too many reactive oxygen species that accumulate in our plants, then this ultimately leads to the death of our plants. We're also concerned about brine because it also has multiple negative effects on soil chemical and physical health. So if there's too much sodium on our soil absorption sites, then this poses the potential of soil dispersion. So what this looks like is shown in the upper right. So the first image shows our stable flocculated soil aggregates, and we can see how the water is moving through them at an appropriate rate as what's depicted by the arrows. But if there's too high of an SAR and they go through a wetting period, then these aggregates begin to swell. And you can see the water begin to pool and our water doesn't want to move through our soil aggregates so readily. And if there's too much sodium on our soil absorption sites, these aggregates swell to the point of dispersion. And then we get little to no water movement through our soil. And so the relationship between the sodium absorption ratio and electrical conductivity is shown in the graph in the upper left. So for example, we have a high SAR and a low EC, will likely see some soil structural problems. But if we have a high SAR and a high EC, and it's likely we'll see a more stable soil structure. Um, and what this looks like is shown in this slide here. So we have two clay surfaces that are represented here. One has sodium on this adsorption site and one has sodium. And both of these go through a wetting period. So on the top, we see that sodium exhibits extensive swelling and eventually it leads to dispersion of our soil aggregates, whereas calcium only exhibits limited swelling. And the reason sodium on our adsorption sites causes dispersion in our soils is because sodium has an affinity to be hydrated, whereas calcium does not. And the reason we see this is that it essentially comes down to sodium having um, a low charge density. So sodium has a relatively large ionic radius to its comparatively small charge, whereas calcium has a charge density that's twice that of sodium. So this promotes flocculation in our soils. So we know that we want calcium on our soil exchange sites rather than sodium. And so historically, gypsum has been the most common in-situ amendment that's used for our sodic and brine impacted soils. And an example of what this looks like is shown in the picture right below the caption there. So we have a brine impacted soil aggregate and it's put into a petri dish with just water versus we have a similar aggregate that's put in a calcium sulfate solution. And I think it's pretty clear to see that there's improved aggregate stability when the soil aggregate is introduced to a cal calcium sulfate solution. And some examples of pelletized gypsum that we have on campus at NDSU. Sorry, I don't know why I keep saying that. <laughs> so we have two examples here. Um, and so the pros of pelletized gypsum is that it's easy to find. You can find this stuff in any garden section and it's also pretty inexpensive. But the issue with gypsum is that it's pretty insoluble at about two to 2.5 grams per liter. And also another issue specifically with pelletized gypsum is that there's a relatively low surface area so that this is even less conducive for it going into solution. And the only way for our calcium amendments to be effective in our brine impacted areas is we need these to go into solution. 
And another type of gypsum I want to talk about is flue gas desulfurization gypsum. And many of you may be familiar with it because it's produced in North Dakota. So flue gas desulfurization gypsum is produced in the coal refinery process. So in these pre-treatments of coal, a lot of the times there's SO2 gas that's emitted. And to prevent this SO2 gas from being emitted directly into the atmosphere, they go through our wet scrubbers. So this gas goes through the wet scrubber and either a calcium carbonate slurry or solution is then sprayed with the gas and this reacts to form calcium sulfide. And calcium sulfide has no use to us. So then it's force oxidated to form calcium sulfate, which then can either be used in construction scenarios or for us in our agricultural settings and brine remediation. And so some of the pros of flue gas gypsum is that there's a significantly higher surface area than pelletized gypsum as it's usually kind of a powder and it's produced locally and it's even cheaper than our pelletized gypsum at about $10 per ton. But it's still gypsum, so it's still relatively insoluble at two to 2.5 grams per liter. And you might be thinking that there's other calcium sources that are much more soluble. And one that may come to mind is calcium chloride. And it is much more soluble at about 745 grams per liter. And another pro associated with calcium chloride is it's easily accessible. But some of the cons of calcium chloride is that chlorides are usually highly regulated, especially in North Dakota. Um, so the maximum contaminant level of chlorides in our surface and groundwaters is 250 milligrams per liter. And another con associated with calcium chloride is that it's relatively expensive, costing over $1,000 per ton. Another example of a calcium source that might come to mind is calcium nitrate. This is also an extremely soluble amendment and is also readily accessible and is produced as a fertilizer for specialty crops such as potatoes. Um, and, but the issue with calcium nitrate is that nitrate concentrations are also regulated in our surface and groundwaters and the maximum contaminant level of nitrates in North Dakota is only 10 milligrams per liter. And I put this as a con because the price is essentially dependent on the cost of nitrogen, which is highly variable. And there's other products that are sold for the purpose of sodic soil or brine spill remediation. And there's a whole ton I could list here, but I chose to list D-Cell Plus, which is a common one I've been seeing around lately. And some of the pros of D-Cell Plus, it's highly soluble, it's sold as a solution. And like I said, it's really important to consider this in our amendments for our brine spill remediation because we need our amendments to be in solution for them to be effective. But some of the cons associated with D-Cell Plus is we still have to keep in mind our nitrate concentrations. There's a little typo here, I noticed that but the maximum contaminant level of nitrate is 10 milligrams per liter. And so through nitrification, the potential for ammonium to turn into nitrate is still there. So it's something to consider. And then also uh, it's listed that there's active potassium in D cell plus. I wasn't sure how much there was because I couldn't find a clear chemical composition of D cell plus. It was only listed that there was active calcium, potassium and ammonium. But we still have to keep in mind that potassium is still considered a soil dispersive agent, such as like sodium, although it only has half of the dispersive properties of sodium, still something to consider in something like D-cell plus. And the price of D-cell plus is unclear. I couldn't find the price of just buying the solution or even the surfaces or services associated with applying it. So that was kind of unclear for me. And also, like I said, the composition of something like D-cell plus is pretty unclear. So we have our insoluble salts, such as gypsum. We have our other calcium sources that pose threats to our groundwater safety and other things that are marketed for brine spill cleanup. But I mean, I feel like there might be other options. So this prompted the idea of why not use calcium acetate as an alternative to gypsum for brine spill remediation. And calcium acetate has about the same amount of calcium that gypsum does, and it's much more soluble than gypsum. And calcium acetate is much more expensive than gypsum, but the thought is that less time and less water is needed to put calcium acetate into solution and to allow calcium to replace sodium on soil exchange sites to ultimately improve the saturated hydraulic conductivity. And just to hone home kind of the importance of our amendment solubility, here's a map of North Dakota. And this shows 
precipitation values from April to September over a 30 year period. And as you can see in our Western oil producing counties, their rainfall rarely exceeds 14 inches. So something important to consider. So to investigate to see if calcium acetate is a good alternative to gypsum, I use a brine impacted soil from McKenzie County, North Dakota. And the corresponding soil information is shown in the upper right hand corner. So I tested this against other amendments, pelletized gypsum and blue gas gypsum. And I mixed these different amendments with my soil at five different rates at zero tons per acre, one, five, 10, and then finally 20 tons per acre. And so just to recap, so that's a lot of numbers. We had three amendments at four different rates and then four rates or four reps of those and then four reps of control, which equals 52 total runs for measuring my saturated hydraulic conductivity. And this was my saturated hydraulic conductivity method. So my soils were packed into Tempe cells using methods similar to those by Sommerfeld et al. So about a centimeter of my soil was added to the cell at a time. Then I would tap the edge of the cell to allow the soil to, and to settle and compact a little bit. And then I disturbed this surface to prevent any artificial boundary from forming within the Tempe cell. And once all of these were assembled, I randomized them amongst the Tempe cell holders. This is kind of shown in the upper right hand corner there. And then I attached these to a main water reservoir and that's shown in the lower left hand there. And once the water was turned on, I collected the leachate that moved through the Tempe cells in increments of 15 to 25 milliliter um, increments. And this is determined to be about a half, of, half of a pore volume. And so then my saturated hydraulic conductivity was then determined by the time it took for the volume of water to move through the Tempe cells. And just an example of what a Tempe cell looks like shown on the lower right. So we have the top and bottom of the Tempe cell, which above and below that is a stainless steel screen. So this just helps to distribute the water over the soil surface a bit more evenly. And then we also have our filter paper, which helps to retain soil particles and then the main core in the center, which holds the soil. And these were the results. So this graph shows my average saturated hydraulic conductivity values. On the y-axis is the KSAT measured in centimeters per hour. And then on the x-axis, we have our amendments with their corresponding rates. So I'll just start with the furthest left columns, which kind of serves as our control. And we see very minimal saturated hydraulic conductivity in those soils. And then next I want to talk about maybe our pelletized gypsum. So we can see that at all rates of our pelletized gypsum, these are all labeled D. So this means that we didn't see a significant difference in any of the rates of our pelletized gypsum from our control. And then moving on to our flue gas gypsum, we, these are labeled C and BC and then C and C. So this means that Amongst any rate of flue gas gypsum, we didn't see any significant difference between each of those runs, but we did see a significant difference between the flue gas gypsum amendments and the control. And then finally moving on to the calcium acetate. Um, with calcium acetate, we did see a significant difference, of course, from the control. And we also saw that with increasing rates of calcium acetate, we did see an increase in saturated hydraulic conductivity. So where do we go next? So I only did this in the lab. Ideally, we could bring this to a field setting. And this is what something like that might look like. So of course, we'd start with our brine impacted soil. We have our high EC values, our high SAR values. And a lot of the times in these situations, we see a salt crust that accumulates on the surface and sparse vegetation. And then we would apply our calcium acetate to the surface and then we would irrigate. This would allow our salts to solubilize. And an important thing to consider during this step is we need to maintain the ratio between our SAR and our EC just to maintain flocculation. And once everything's in solution, then our calcium is able to replace sodium on our soil absorption sites. This is going to decrease the SAR, increase our saturated hydraulic conductivity, and reduce the risk of plate dispersion. And so once we have calcium on our soil exchange sites, then we could collect sodium and chloride through something like tile drainage. And then we would safely dispose of the solution through something like um, deep injection. And then another next step in this process would be to investigate if the acetate um, anion from calcium acetate serves as an available carbon source for soil microbes. And 
This would be good for promoting microbial activity, as this is kind of a part of reclamation. Um, but a lot of work has yet to be done on that, but it looks pretty promising. And here were some sources that I used to put this talk together today. And that concludes my talk of using calcium acetate as an alternative to gypsum <laughs> for improving brine impacted soils. Mm -hmm.